It's our pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Glenn Manchester, again, newer grad from the last couple of years. What you're gonna find with Glenn is from day one when we met, including today, and the, some of the stories he's gonna share with you, is his passion for outreach dentistry and paying it forward and giving it back using his clinical skills and having fun along the way. All of you guys get so, so busy, of course, doing what you do, and it's amazing on how you can help so many people. Of course, uh, Jake referenced it earlier when he was talking about some of the mission trips he had. So with that, it's our extreme privilege to introduce and announce Dr. Glenn Manchester to share his thoughts. All right, um, hi everyone. Uh, as uh, Vic said, I'm Dr. Glenn Manchester. So my presentation is gonna be on dental outreach. Um, giving back both at home in Canada and abroad. So I'm going to start with some background about me. Um, a lot of people know me in the audience. I was a student at the Schulich School of Dentistry not too long ago, graduated in 2017. Um, I've been born in Oakville, Ontario. Uh, Oakville, Ontario. I was raised in Linden, Ontario. Um, I went to Western for both my undergrad and my dentistry. It was eight years of a lot of partying for... Uh, for London, if anyone goes to Western, or you guys are currently involved with it, so the students at the back. Um, I'm working in Waterloo currently. I've been a dentist at Parkside Drive Dentistry um, for the last two and a half years. That's at Parkside DR Dental. Please follow me from the last thing. It's just my staff and my girlfriend right now. So I go, did you know we make night guards? And the staff's like, yes, I made them for you yesterday. I'm not going to like that post. Um, <laughs> So moving onwards, my first experience with dental volunteering, um, I went when I was going between my third and fourth year of dental school. So I hadn't had a ton of clinical experience. The trip that I'm gonna show you guys is sort of marketed to be like, go on this wonderful vacation, get some experience, do a lot of things. Um, I was approached by Michael Karabash. I don't know if he's spoken to the students yet. Um, he's involved with DMC Law in Toronto, it's a law firm but he organizes a large group of dentists from Toronto to go every, uh, I believe it's at the end of the summer, um, and we go to Jamaica. He connected me with Joseph Wright of Great Shape Incorporated, and I organized a student group of about 10 students. We got donations. I, I saw that Dean um, from Patterson was in the office. He did a lot of donations, so thank you, Dean. Um, and that was our first trip. And you can imagine a bunch of 20-something-year-old dental students um, going to Jamaica, there was a lot of very hazy mornings for the first patient. I'm kidding, don't do hang hungover dentistry. But <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um, some background on Great Shape. This is the organization that I work with a lot. Uh, they are founded in 1988. The executive director was Joseph Wright, um, who's named Papa Joe. He's a large, ma large white man with uh, dreadlocks. He was actually a reggae singer before he went to this. So he's a very interesting gentleman. Um, they do a number of programs through the Caribbean, eye care, dental care, special education. The program that I work with is called the A Thousand Smiles Project, so that's dental outreach in Jamaica, St. Lucia, and Grenada. So here's how it's marketed, and here's how it was marketed to me. Um, there's 13 different 10-day sessions. Look at this beautiful white sandy beach, crystal waters. You're going to be doing dentistry in paradise. You're going to... Now, I will say that, actually. The, accommodations are donated by the Sandals Foundation. So if no one's, if you haven't done a dental outreach trip, this is a great trip to get started with because it's kind of, the pictures that Dr. Carrier was showing is not quite the same as this. This is volunteerism in sort of a sense, but it's still, it's, it's a very rewarding trip, but you do stay at a Sandals. If anyone else has, if anyone's ever stayed at a Sandals, um, it's pretty much the nicest place you can stay for all-inclusive vacations. Uh, you do have to pay project fees and flights, so I think that accounts to about $1,500 uh, Canadian, give or take. So uh, for the dentists in the audience, you've got to remember that's a week off work, so there's no production from you for that week, and you're paying $1,500 to go here. That being said, I was just looking at trips to Sandals because I'm a hopeless romantic, and March break, it's about $8,000 US for a week for two people, not including flights. So you do get spoiled a little bit in that sense. So the expectations, you're gonna be sipping mojitos on the beach, you're gonna be dining at these beautiful uh, beach views at the restaurant, you're gonna be looking at the sunset there. Those are all photos just taken by me. I'm a terrible photographer, so I need to pick up that book that was just recommended, although that's dental photography. Uh, this, is a, this is Sandals and a Grill. This is the one I stayed at. It is, it is paradise. So, you fly down, you get a first weekend on resort, and then Monday hits. 
And Monday is sort of a return to reality for these trips. Um, we do not work on the resort, we work in the communities. And you are going out to a location that is generally a 20 or 30 minute drive away from the resort. Everybody comes out in the morning, you get in these little shuttles, you can see that it's very cozy. There's some supplies in the back of the shuttle there that are definitely not gonna hit anybody if you go over a bump because everything is packed in there. You bring food with you. That was sarcasm. People have been hit by those boxes. Um, you get an assigned driver. This is Mojo. He was my driver. He is a very large, very scary Jamaican man. He's actually a sweetheart, I'm joking. But he, this brings up another point, and people are concerned with safety when they go on these trips because you are working in communities. I mean, I know that there's some discussion about Kingston being very dangerous in Jamaica. Every citizen in Jamaica knows why you're there. This is an established program. It has been there for about 20 years. You are given a community member, you're working with other community members, and the local police is quite, uh, they're quite accommodating and making you feel comfortable as well. So, Mojo was our enforcer. He didn't have to do anything. He basically sat on Instagram while we were doing work all day. Um, I hope this video works. It does not, that's okay. That's Jamaican driving. I will just give a bit of background is uh, they drive on the opposite side of the road um, and I ride suicide when I go to the clinics because I'm the clinic head. Suicide riding means that the driver is here. You are to the left of him and forwards uh, right up against the window and it is some wild drive in there. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of almost oncoming crashes. So apologies that video didn't work, but that's fine. When we get to the location, here's my first trip. That is uh, the group we were paired with a dental school um, in the United States, Temple University, and we had a clinic. The clinic that we had was in the background there. Uh, that is a church community storage center. The community center is actually in a different location. So here's the inside. That's about as brightly lit as it gets. Um, there is no air conditioning. We went in mid-August. Doing dentistry in mid-August in Jamaica is hot. If you are not out, there is no you're not in your office, you are in a very creative working environment. You can't really see the chairs there, but we'll move on. This is my second clinic, actually. Uh, this was in the, the town of Lucy. Um, this township was actually one of the nicer clinics you can go to. You can see the inside there. There's cross ventilation with everything. Um, there's a lot of space. You can get an example of the type of chairs that we work on. Um, they are not reclining chairs. They're basically a glorified beach chair that you put people back on. So. Um, the nice thing about the town of Lucy is that that was one of the towns where we actually had the community members of the town help us with clinic booking. So you can see that sheet that was put across the back there. That's to separate the patients from where we're working. Um, and then there was community members from the Rotary Club that were outside handling patient intake. It is a big eye opener when you go in on Monday for these things because these programs are promoted and everything is free, you'll pull up and there'll be 600 people waiting outside the building, waiting to get dentistry done. So <laughs> another important thing to note is if you're not in Lucy, you're doing that on your own. So you're figuring out the best way to split people up, the best way to have them do medical forms, um, who's seeing who and if they're getting hygiene extractions, etc. So I was very fortunate on this trip that the community did that for us. Uh, this is some intimate working environments here. So again, this is my second clinic. It is, this is the most spacious you can get, but there's still four dentists working in a row. Um, I'm doing extractions. I tend to do, I went down with a couple dentists from Toronto. We do not work with, we, they constantly tell me that we're going to be getting x-rays when we're doing work. We do not have x-rays when we're doing work. I don't know how many dentists are comfortable doing extractions without x-rays doing work. You certainly don't want to be going surgically if you can avoid it. I personally do the shake test to do patient intake, and that's where I say a patient comes up and I say, what's your problem? This tooth hurts, I want it out. I say, okay, wiggle it for me. They wiggle it, yep, get in the chair, that's coming out. They wiggle it, it's not moving. I say, let's see what happens. <laughs> if, it's, uh, if it's not going well, it might be a better uh, case to give them some antibiotics and some pain medication and send them to a dentist in Jamaica an important part of these trips, do, less harm, do not do more harm to the patient than they're currently in. If they need to go to a dentist who's equipped with x-rays and surgical tools, they will. You just need to tell them. Uh, that is me after my first extraction of the day. It's hard to see there, but that is sweat all over uh, my stomach there. That's 8.30 in the morning. That is about a 39 degrees Celsius day. 
drink a lot of water, have a lot of electrolytes. You will pass out if you do not. I don't know if anyone does extractions. Um, Jamaican people have a denser bone structure. If you can't fire your forearm muscles to torque a tooth, you're not getting it out. So you gotta be hydrated with everything here. Uh, here we have, this is uh, one of the more rural clinics. This one actually has some luxury. There's some reclining chairs. Um, but you can see that it's a very enclosed space and not a lot of air ventilation. Here's a, oh, here's a beautiful one. There's no separation from patients and the work that you're doing. So everyone's just, you, have an, you literally have an audience gallery while you're working. There's some beautiful exposed wiring in the corner there. Um, I'm, being, I'm joking with this. It's a well set up trip, but there's some realities that you guys have to realize that, again, we're not doing dentistry in our offices. It's hard work. Here's a little guy learning what's about to happen to him looking down at his sister there. So I think he was probably, tell show do may get you somewhere in that, but I don't know if we had a papoose board to bring out for him, but that's a joke, don't do that, please. Uh, okay, if there's anybody, if there's any reps in public health, I would like you to leave the room. The dentists who are currently graduated know what I'm talking, or dentists that are working know what I'm talking about here. So I wear a gown and mask, and I change everything every time. I don't, don't tell them. Um, <laughs> here's your sundries. So you can see that your burrs aren't individually bagged. Things aren't individually separated. You're in a community center. I mean, you do have sterilization. Uh, sorry, that's my second, that's my first clinic there. You can see, oh, you can see the gowns were getting well utilized, being stacked underneath everything else there. <laughs> no one's wearing a gown in 39 degrees Celsius. Um, there's our sterilizer. So we have two portable sterilizers. We have one ultrasonic unit. You have about 10 professionals working on patients concurrently. So you are flash sterilizing things unwrapped and taking them out hot. And you put them down like this. There's my favorite oral surgery instrument right there. Do a C4, C5 transection. Patient doesn't have any complaints anymore. You're going to prison, but... Um, but you can see everything is loose. So you sterilize your hands, you grab what you need, Please don't go through things, with bloody, through things with bloody gloves. I've seen a student do that when I was there with students, and yeah, it's a headache. So, um, and here's the realities of work. You're not sitting down and doing occlusals. You're not putting a rubber dam on. You are seeing people who come in like this. Um, there's people who come in, 5% of the Jamaican population has access to regular dental care. It is prohibitively expensive for them, and we do not discriminate on who comes in to our clinics. So everything is free. People come in like this. As I said before, I do the shake test, line up. Which teeth do we want out? All right, let's go. Uh, I'm working at getting donations for silver diamine fluoride, not that I use it that much in my office, but you have a lot of early childhood caries and patients who have never seen a dentist before. And it can be hard and they can be scared. They know that they need it done, but you gotta be understanding with things. They will also get dentures. So a lot of people actually will access denturists more than dentistry. So you can take teeth out, they will get them replaced. So we had someone do some nice suturing here. Um, I don't know how that gentleman, he, I went with him, that was last year. I don't know how he got that out. That's no x-ray, that's a non-surgical approach. So that man has forearms of steel. I think he's a rock climber or something and there's a professor, I don't know. It's just, there's some rowdy stuff that you see. Dental hygiene, we have dental hygiene. I go with dental hygienists. These are some lovely women. Uh, they're dental hygiene students from Salem, Oregon, which is about as white as it can come. Um, there were some cultural realities for them when they were coming in. I remember the first day, I'm gonna pick on them for a second. The first day we were on the bus and they go, Dr. Manchester, how do I ask the patients if they have high blood pressure? I said, Lindsay, you just ask them if they have, have high blood pressure. They speak English in Jamaica. Like, it's, the, it's, their, it's their language. That's mean. They were very nice, but they hadn't been exposed to a lot of things. So it's a good trip for them. You can see them working five in a row there. Um, they're helping a lot of people. As a student, if you guys go on this trip, you're going to be expected to do hygiene. But it's fun hygiene. It is blasting calculus. You don't have to probe. You don't have to find scale, although you should if there's some diagnostic potential for it. But you are wall to wall blasting calculus. My first Cavitron that I have there overheated so many times that I didn't bother letting it cool down. I just had 10 Cavitron tips. It was just doof, 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 switching them out as I was doing it. So it's very satisfying, but you need to understand that you're sort of having a blend between how many people you need to see and how many people are waiting, okay? Um, some cultural realities. They do speak English, but they also speak Patois. Uh, Patois is, 
a, it's Jamaican Creole. It's, it's, there's French and all sorts of stuff in it. I don't understand it, to be honest. If you go into the sugarcane country, you do not know what anybody's saying. Um, some of the personal sayings there they have, this is a popular one with young people these days. Wagwan means what's up. Medea means I'm here, like I'm living, it's my day. Uh, Shuga, actually I should go back to those ladies and be kind to them for a second. You can't ask someone if they have diabetes, they don't know what that means. They say, I'm gonna do terrible Jamaican accents, I apologize. They go, I have the sugar, I've got the sugar man. And I was like, what, I, like candy? Like you're gonna eat candy in the, while you're coming to the dentist? But that means diabetes. Or they say, you gonna juke me now, which means are you gonna give me a needle? So, some more, this is a slightly inappropriate section. There's some more embarrassing mix-ups. When I do extractions, I'm always telling patients to be aware of the blood clot. Do not disturb the blood clot. Pronounce the O. Clat in Jamaican Creole means a very rude word for the female anatomy that also starts with a C. If you call a female, if a female thinks you're talking about her bloody clat, she <laughs> is gonna be very angry with you. Baggies. At the end of hygiene, it says, don't forget your baggie. Uh, you know, a young woman's walking, hey, don't forget your baggie. Baggy means panties, don't say that. They'll be like, what? <laughs> Buddy, I, I'm a Canadian, I say bud constantly. I go down, I sit down with a guy, I go, how's my little buddy doing today? Buddy means penis. He doesn't know how it's doing. <laughs> He's like, he's like, what? What am I here for? The mom's like, I, we're leaving. We're, let's get out of here right now. No. Important thing to note, they understand that you don't understand. No one will get mad at you, but it's awarenesses that I didn't have when I went, okay? Uh, some other cultural things. This is Jamaica's national fruit. Uh, this is ackee. They cook this with salted cod. That's their national dish. Salted cod and ackee. Ackee tastes like scrambled eggs. They have this for breakfast. Lots of people in Jamaica have high blood pressure because it's an island, everything is salted. So if you check their blood pressure, there's very regular readings that are very high, it's normal. Another cultural reality, marijuana. Grows very wild in Jamaica, a lot of people access it. Interestingly, it's actually considered lower class to smoke marijuana, so if you ask a patient if they do it, they'll, they might get offended for a second, but they understand that you don't, you don't know, but they you will usually say no. These are Rastafarians. That is a religion in Jamaica. Um, they are, if you go to sugarcane country, you will see a lot of them. They're wonderful people, but they're very stoic. They're quiet, they will not talk. They will just sit there, maybe because they're so stoned, they're like, what is, what is this guy saying to me? No, but they will just sit there and, and accept suffering without, in silence. But they're wonderful people if you can access it. Um, this is an important one that AIDS is more prevalent in Jamaica than it is here. Um, not to say that it's rampant, but it's definitely an awareness thing. You need to be aware of needle sticks. There's also a couple other layers going on with this poster that I don't quite understand, but that's apparently a public health campaign that, real, that disabled men are real men too. So, awareness of everything. You've worked out a long week, you're tired, you're sweating, you see 20 patients a day in hot conditions, but here's the payoff. Um, Jamaicans are a lovely, lovely people, and they are so grateful for what they're doing. They know that you're doing things for free. They understand what you're giving up to be there. This is a picture of the end of the last day of clinic. The gentleman in the corner there, Kingsley, is, uh, he was expert of special forces. He is now the community leader. He runs the Rotary Club. He stayed up for two nights making us personalized plaques and buying us gifts to give to us at the end of clinic. And you can imagine there wasn't a dry eye in that building at the end of that. So it's very rewarding. Again, very rewarding. Just happy, happy people all around. I'm sorry, I'm trying to go quickly because I know everybody's hungry. They will bring you gifts, as I said before. I don't know what we're supposed to do with those lobsters, but it's a nice thought. Um, they bring you coconuts. I had one woman uh, bring me a bag of plums that I was supposed to juice. Uh, point of recommendation, if you have a stomach like mine, don't go juicing local fruit that you don't know where it comes from. I was pretty useless the next day at clinic, and luckily we had running water there for plumbing, but there you go. Um, <laughs> so I did this trip, and then I went home. I do this trip every year, and it's wonderful. And I come back, and I'm, I go, there's people in Canada that need this too. We have, we have populations that don't have access to dental care, people who fall through the cracks. What can we do? And my assistant made me aware of this, actually. It's the community dental clinic in Kitchener. Um, I do dentistry for the homeless. I do dentistry for battered women. I do dentistry for youths who are on the street. Uh, I do this once to twice a month. And I'm going to talk about why I do it, so what I would consider infrequently. Um, 
But here's the Working Center's message. They want to improve access to preventative dental services and dental health care for people who are at homeless or risk of homelessness. Full range of services. We have a full clinic. Uh, we have digital x-rays, Panorex, basically the whole shebang. Um, if, everyone need, if anyone needs anything, that's one of the women that I help there. I will caution you that if you get involved with something like this, it is sad. It is hard. It is sad. A lot of people who are, people who are homeless have drug problems, drug, or sorry, they have substance abuse issues, I should say. Um, battered women is incredibly, uh, I, I don't know if that's the proper term, so I apologize if it isn't, but it's very hard to work on them because they have issues with, I mean, I'm a young man and they're getting pain inflicted on them. So you got to have a gut of steel to go into that. And I only, I can, like once a month is sometimes my tops because there can be some hard days. I remember I had one guy, you're there to help. I had one guy who I had to take his blood pressure uh, to take some extractions and he said, I don't, I can't pull up my sleeve. I said, no, it's fine. Like, I don't, I just, I can't do it without. So he pulls up his sleeve, pock marks completely up his, his arm, right? And he looks at me and he goes, oh, I, there was a burning, I had a hot pan in my house and it fell. And I was like, dude, I just burned my mouth on a pizza pocket this morning. Like, don't worry about it. Get in here. Like, let's take that blood pressure. And he looked at me and he said, thank you. You know, I don't want to be doing this. And I said, it's not my, it's not my place to judge what you're doing. It's my place to help you and get you out of the dental discomfort that you're in. So, it's hard. But if actually, if anyone is around, um, sorry, there's some more pictures of clinic. I'm getting off track on stories. If anyone is in Kitchener-Waterloo and you guys want to get involved, or if you're a new, a new grad and you come to the area, um, they need people. Um, you can DM me, it's at Glenn Manchester. Um, if you want information on that, or information on the Jamaica trip, I will, I'll hook you guys up with that. Um, but you always have someone with you there to help out. So uh, I'm going to just wrap up here. Some, uh, some, this is a, a slide I added, some realities afterwards. Um, you're going to graduate, and you're going to start making money, and life is going to be the best because you're out of Schulich, and it's no longer this hellhole that you've been putting up with. No offense if there's instructors here. Um, <laughs> at least for me. The side note, get a therapist. When you graduate, you'll feel much better. Um, you're going to make a lot of money, and things are going to be great, but then you're going to fall into the daily grind. And the daily grind can be hard. No one wants to go to the dentist. No patients are coming in to get frozen and be like, oh, great. You know, I walk in a room, I go, hey, Mrs. Jones, how's it going today? She's like, I'm not the dentist. How do you think it's going? I'm like, I am the dentist. How do you think that's going for me? Um, you got to break things up. You need to have a work-life balance, as Dr. Carrier was speaking about. Get some things going in your personal life so that dentistry isn't your end-all, be-all. Um, it's a great profession. I love what I do but I need to have a separation. So when I go home, I go home. I'm also an associate, so that's different. I know when you own, there's some more uh, realities that you have to be tied up with. Um, another office reality, uh, musculoskeletal discomfort. This is a free plug over to Vic here. You're gonna hurt. You're gonna hurt working full time. I, my back still hurts. My back's hurting right now as I'm walking around up here. Um, I locked in my disability insurance with Vic or whoever your advisor is, lock it in early. My back didn't hurt in dental school. First three months of full-time work, I was like, oh God, how am I supposed to do this? It's better, but it's, I'm more comfortable because I can pursue treatment that I need to pursue because I have the coverage in place that will not be influenced by the fact that I now have a condition. Not that I have a condition, although I am a little wacky. Um, associate agreements. This is where someone like Vic comes in, in play too. They can be worded very scary. My associate agreement said I wasn't allowed to leave the office. Is that, will that legally hold up? Vic, no, it, did, it would not. So sign the paper, who cares? They're not going to enforce it. But you don't know that unless you have someone look at it, and it can be very intimidating. Um, that all ties into the need for good advisors. Continuing education, Dr. Carrier spoke about that. Um, I did some surgical training as well. I love taking out wisdom teeth. Um, I have done a lot of Invisalign training. I do a ton of Invisalign, it's great. It's like a really relaxed part of the day, especially when you have patients going, you basically just come in, say hi, shoot the shit, oh, pardon me, shoot the stuff for two minutes and then they leave. Um, do some continuing ed, and that lends to the varieties, the spice of life in the office. If you're doing different things constantly in the day, you're gonna be happier. No one wants to sit down and do wall to wall MODs for like six hours. Like I could, I, I'm again in more pain just thinking about that. Final thought, so the one thing that I notice in our profession, and it's not to criticize anybody, I'm not to st stand on a soapbox, but we tend to think about this a lot of the time, and it's, it's not to say that you guys shouldn't make a lot of money for what you do. You've trained very hard, 
We're all very caring practitioners. We should do very well for ourselves. But I see things come from other offices. It's, it's more the horror stories that you hear when someone's like, oh, you know, I went to my dentist and I have 10 cavities. Can you take a look at my x-rays? You don't see any cavities. You should ever criticize, but like, come on guys, you're missing the forest for the trees here. Like, we are a healthcare profession. We are doctors. We're also business owners, but we're doctors. And our number one thing is to help people. And you will never get more in touch with that than when you go on a trip where you're working in hellish conditions solely for the good of the people there. It's life-changing. It makes you realize how fortunate we are here. And it really puts things into perspective. So if you haven't done it, I would highly recommend it, guys. And if you have any questions, again, please reach out to me. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry if I ran into lunch, but you guys were wonderful. Thank you. So he's an associate still right now, but uh, sooner or later he's going to buy a practice, and who wouldn't want to line up to have a guy like that to be looking after their care for the next 20, 25 years? Glenn, thank you so much, man, for sharing your story. Really appreciate it. Glenn Manchester.